Okay, go ahead. What's it? Hi, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bo Pang. I'm a medical school graduate from China. And today I'm gonna talk about the vestibular schwannoma. Earlier this month, we saw a patient, very interesting patient with vestibular schwannoma. So I think this might be a great opportunity for us to review this disease a little bit. So here's today's plan. First, I'm gonna introduce our patient, and then we'll talk about the epidemiology, the pathology, uh, uh, clinical, pre uh, clinical presentations followed by diagnosis and the treatment. So, as I mentioned earlier, we have a patient with vestibular schwannoma. The patient is 53, uh, 57 years old, excuse me, 57 years old, retired Air Force soldier with history of occupational noise exposure and bilateral hearing loss over three decades. And the patient reports hearing loss, is, which is more prominent on the right side, associated with dizziness and tinnitus. And the patient is using hearing aid, but he did not receive any other treatment for the hearing loss. And then the patient was diagnosed with right side acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma two years ago. And after that, MRI was repeated every six months. And her, his last MRI shows vestibular schwannoma measure two centimeter in diameter. So that's the patient. Now let's uh, have a look at the vestibular schwannoma itself. So first epidemiology. Well, vestibular schwannoma is the third most common intracranial non-malignant tumor after meningiomas and pituitary adenomas. Usually it is uh, unilateral, but it could be bilateral as well. And bilateral tumors are a hallmark of neurofibromatosis type 2 or NF2. So the overall incidence of the uh, vestibular schwannoma in this country was around 1.09 per 100,000 population according to the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. There's no gender difference reported. However, the incidence is higher in the Asians and lower in the African Americans. And the incidence uh, the instance is on the rise over the past few decades, possibly due to the increasing use of the MRI scan. And the medium age at diagnosis now is around 62 years old. It used to be around 52 years old decades ago, but somehow the peak age at diagnosis is delayed. And then for the pathogenesis and risk factors, so naturally, the first thing that occurred in our mind is NF2, because we have tested a couple of times of the NF2 tumor suppression gene during the USML examinations. So actually, the NF2 tumor suppression gene, which located on the chromosome 22, is not only responsible for those familial cases, it is responsible for the sporadic cases as well. And the NF2 gene produces a protein called merlin which acts as a tumor uh, suppressor. And interestingly, interestingly it is the merlin does not only appear in the uh, vestibular schwannoma, it is also expressed in those uh, meningiomas and some other brain tumors as well. So the NF2 mutation um, gives a chance for the tumor to develop, even for those sporadic vestibular schwannomas by allelic activation of NF2 is often reported. And another risk factor here is a childhood exposure to low dose radiation. Sometimes in the past, uh, the children will receive the low dose radiation as a treatment for enlarged tonsils or adenoid. And these children are, will be at a higher risk to develop uh, vestibular schwannoma later in their lives. And also I put the noise exposure here as a risk factor even though it is controversial and the data is conflicting. The reason I put it here is because our patient come to us with a history of occupational noise exposure. And he was wondering if there's a link between his noise exposure and his tumor. Uh, however, we do have two population-based case control studies. Studies shows that there's no uh, solid association found between the noise exposure and the risk of vestibular schwannoma. And I wish I could see more about the risk factors, but our research data is limited and I didn't find any other solid risk factors for this tumor. And then I would like to deviate a little bit 
to talk about the neurofibromatosis type 2, because oftentimes uh, it comes together with the LF2 mutation in the exams. So usually the vestibular schwannoma are a uh, uni unilateral solitary tumor. However, about around four to six percent of the uh, vestibular schwannomas are associated with LF2, uh, with the neurofibromatosis type 2. And the uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 has a birth rate around one in every uh, 25 to 33,000 population. And a, a large amount of the NF2 actually is caused by de novo mutation. It is the same for, our, for some of our patients. They come here as the first one found in their family. And another thing quite interesting here is that um, even though we're tested that uh, NF2 is usually present with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, but it is not always the case. Actually, about 10% of neurofibromatosis have to come with unilateral vestibular schwannoma. So we may, have, we may uh, be patient, we may be cautious about this. And then I put a definition of the neurofibromatosis type 2 by the European Association of Neuro-Oncology here. So here we saw four different definitions of neurofibromatosis type 2. It could be bilateral vestibular schwannomas. It could be something else, such as you have a history of the F2, or maybe you have just unilateral one vestibular schwannoma plus some other brain tumors, or you don't need, we don't necessarily need to have the vestibular schwannoma. Patient may come with, a multiple, with multiple magiomas plus some other brain tumors. And that's what we saw from another patient this Wednesday. The patient have uh, eight magiomas, but no other types of tumor has been found with that patient. And so again, we don't necessarily need the vestibular, uh, bilateral vestibular schwannoma to diagnose NF2, that's a point. And then naturally the next question occurred in our mind is when should we consider NF2? So for those patients with unilateral vestibular schwannoma, if they are really young or for those with meningioma who, are, who is really young, we should think about the possibility of NF2. Also for those older patients who have two uh, NF2 related tumors such as meningiomas or some other brain tumors, we should also consider the possibility of NF2. And the next question is, when should we screen or should we screen our patient for the neurofibromatosis type 2? Well, currently, uh, the rule of mutation screening for NF2 in all patients with a, with a unilateral vestibular schwannoma is less certain. Our patient has just one vestibular schwannoma without any other tumors. So for a patient like our patient, uh, it is not quite sure whether we should screen it and now. And then back to the vestibular schwannoma itself, uh, first the pathology. This is not quite important because uh, pathology is not required to diagnose uh, vestibular schwannoma, right? We usually uh, find it on the MRI or yeah, but uh, I put a picture here because we have been tested a couple of times in the exam, like what, what we can see under the microscope. So we have the atony A and atony B areas here. On this picture, on the left side, this is atony A, atony B region, which is loosely organized in the hypercellular. And the right side of the picture, it is highly cellular. This antenna A region, this is a typical finding of vestibular schwannoma and the microscope. And then for the clinical presentation, well, most likely the uh, cochlear nerve will be involved. Not actually, 95% of all the patients with vestibular schwannoma will have cochlear nerve involvement. So, most likely, the patient will have some symptoms such as hearing deficit tinnitus and the sensitivity to sound. Also, about two thirds of patients uh, have vestibular system involvement. So patient may report vertigo or some unsteadiness when they were walking. 
And in some cases, uh, trigeminal nerve and facial nerve may, may be involved as well. So we may find some facial numbness, facial pain, tingling, or some change in taste in our patient. And if the tumor progresses, then cerebellum may be involved and the brainstem may be compressed as well. So later on, the patient may develop symptoms such as taxia, or they may have hydrocephalus or even death without treatment. And then for the diagnosis, well, first physical examination is important because we may find some hearing change as well as other uh, symptoms and physical findings during the physical examination. Also, audio audiometry is used sometimes. But more likely, we'll do the MRI scan for our patient. We may find a tumor here in the CPA region. So that's for the diagnosis part. And then for the treatment, well, generally speaking, there are three different treatment strategies here, observation, surgery, and radiation therapy. But the choice of the treatments is very complicated. Generally speaking, the choice of treatment depends on clinic presentation, the tumor size, and some expertise of the treating center. But as a general rule, if the tumor is small, then observation is reasonable. If the tumor is huge, then we may need a surgery followed with the radiation. And one of the particular interest here is that during the reading, I found that we actually have a medication for the treatment of vestibular schwannoma only in the neurofibromatosis type two patient, the bevacizumab. So this medication showed to be able to decrease the tumor size of the, of the vestibular schwannoma only in those NF2 patient. And then I, uh, I post some key points of the treatment from the Yale guideline last year. So first observation should be considered and it is considered appropriate for those incidental asymptomat asymptomatic vestibular schwannoma. And the alternative choice of treatment for those tumors is, um, is a radiation, radio surgery. And for those small vestibular schwannoma where preserve a facial nerve and hearing function is the primary goal, then maybe the radio surgeries will be preferred. And of course, those large surgery, uh, large, uh, large tumor, of course, surgery will be considered. And then for the follow up, so generally, this patient needs follow up every a few months, and we may do MRI scan. We may also do the audiometry and outpatient consultation. However, there's no, there's limited data to support the specific recommendations for our patients, such as how often should they be. Scan MRI scan, or how often should they follow up? So our patient follow up uh, every six months. That's probably the general choice, but again, we don't have a specific or solid data to support a specific interval of the follow up. Another question our patient will ask is about the tumor growth. Will the tumor grow? Uh, yes, one third of the newly diagnosed with tubular schwannoma will grow in the first three years. And within five years, one, uh, about half of the tumors will grow. And the tumor size and location does not predict the tumor growth. However, the growth rate of the first year of observation or of the follow-up is a strong predictor of the tumor growth later in, the, in their life. And the tumor growth at an average speed is around one millimeter per year. So per up to date, if the tumor grows really fast, for example, over 2.5 millimeter per year, then we need some treatment regardless of the tumor size. So that's a brief review of the vestibular schwannoma. Thank you. Thank you very much.